Hey, good evening once again, or good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are at out there in the Facebook world. Uh, this is Dr. Lloyd D. Kenlo II, um, senior or lead pastor at the Word of God Community Church, and that is in the city of Canton, Ohio. Uh, 3504 Richmond Avenue, Northeast, Canton, Ohio, 44705. If you ever want to drop me a line, uh, you can mail it to that particular address or P.O. Box 9172, Canton, Ohio, 44711. Or you can contact me by church email. That's W O G. C C H U R C H at Gmail dot com. And if you forward that to the email, the church secretary will uh, get any questions or comments uh, back to me. And uh, I will try to address them as soon as possible and as best as I can with the talents and gifts that God has given to me. Uh, once again, I don't do these to argue. Um, however, I don't mind um, disagreement as long as it's in the spirit of brotherly love. Uh, as we read in Ephesians, the uni unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. OK, uh, we've been talking about worldviews for the last six or seven videos. And so I want to continue this. And this evening, um, I would like to talk about hedonism. And uh, I'm not going to go through the introduction that I've been going through. Have you seen any of these? Uh, basically the same introduction. To make it simple, a worldview is how you view the world. A worldview are your eyeglasses to the world. And uh, how you view the world, it colors how you live, how you think, and thus how you live. And uh, we are trying to cover some of the basic worldviews that exist today um, among unredeemed humanity. And uh, they are contrary to God. And they are contrary to the revelation of God that we read in the Holy Scriptures. And that includes both Old and New Testaments. And uh, we are studying these various worldviews or philosophies in order that those of us who are Christians, those of us who have truly embraced Christ as Messiah, Savior, um, we really do believe he died for our sins on the cross once for all. He was buried in the borrowed tomb. And he bodily rose from the dead on the third day. And uh, there is salvation in no one else but this God man, the man God, uh, Theo Anthropos, Anthropos Theo, the God man and the man God, Jesus Christ, the son of the true and the living God. And so, you know, those of you out there who embrace that, um, we're trying to just share some information on with you with the various worldviews out there in order that we as the people of God can oppose them and not only look at the world through um, a biblical worldview, but uh, live according to this biblical worldview that we have. And so in light of all of that, up to this point in all of these, I guess I'll call them lectures sharing of information, uh, all of the worldviews that we have studied fall under the category of secularism. And of course, secularism, I believe that's the first one we studied. It is the belief that man's view of what is right and wrong is constantly changing. And not only is it changing, but it is progressively getting better. And so it's almost like an evolution of the ethics and morality of man. And so secularism says what we believe today 
It is much better than what we believed uh, years ago as far as what is right and what is wrong. And under that umbrella of secularism, uh, we've studied existentialism. And that is the worldview that teaches all things are meaningless because there is no eternity to come. And therefore, meaning in life comes to meaning in life consists of whatever meaning you give it. Um, and normally this is according to what feels good to you. Uh, meaning in life is what feels good to you. Existentialism uh, without regard for the impact on you um, or others. We've looked at what we call pragmatism. Bra pragmatism is a real view that teaches uh, we need to learn to solve our problems apart from God. And we need to do whatever we need to do to resolve our problems quickly. Right now, um, whatever is needed to resolve what we believe is a problem, we need to do it right now, the quickest way possible. And then we'll deal with the consequences later. Um, we've looked at humanism. Humanism is the worldview that teaches man is the measure of all things. Man is the center of the universe rather than God. And man is the standard of what is right and wrong. Therefore, all things uh, man does, they exist to improve man's conditions upon the earth. And so nothing that we do on earth is to glorify God, but it is to satisfy man, make his standard of living better. And so it's all about man. It's all about us. Uh, we looked at positivism. Uh, this is the worldview that teaches truth can only be known if it is verified by the five human senses. Um, taste, smell, hear, sound, um, touch uh, those five senses. And so that's the only way you can know truth if you can examine them with the five um, human senses. And so positivism teaches if you can't verify something to be true according to these human senses we have that uh, it cannot be true or, you know, it is simply something which cannot be known. Uh, pluralism or relativism or pluralistic diversity. That's the last one we studied. It is a worldview that teaches there really are no absolutes. And the reason why is because the only absolutes exist in the realm where God is. And the pluralist would say if he really does exist. And so because absolutes only exist where God is and we can't get into that realm, there are no absolutes. Therefore, the only thing that exists are these many different standards, uh, many different what we would call particulars. And uh, they're all they all exist or coexist together side by side, even though they may contradict one another. Pluralistic relativism is the belief of the worldview that teaches there are no absolute truths. There is no one standard. Uh, of truth that applies to all. And so truth is different for all persons and we must accept whatever truth is for one person, even though it is not for another. It is also expressed through the word diversity. Um, nobody has a different standard for truth. We are all diverse. And since that is true, there is really no right and wrong. It may be right wrong for you, but not another. And so that's what we've looked at thus far. Now this evening, as I said, I want to talk a bit, talk a little bit about hedonism. Uh, hedonism, it really doesn't belong in the category of secularism. Hedonism is really a category all by itself. Yet it affects us, all of us, Often, and I hope you understand all of us are tainted by these different worldviews. It is it is the Christian struggle every day. You know, all of these worldviews play into 
the struggle that those of us who know Christ have between the things of God, the things of the spirit and the things of the flesh, these earthly, sensual, uh, really sinful, ungodly desire. You know, we're in a constant war. If you know Christ, uh, we're in a constant war with these things um, day by day. And it is the spirit of God that enables us to gain the victory over these things as he leads and guides us through the Holy Scriptures and as we submit to the word of God. Uh, but hedonism, it affects everyone. And so uh, we want to be in opposition to this philosophy or way of life called hedonism. And the word is the technical word is we want to be antithetical to it. We want to be in opposition to hedonism in order that the Christian and the world sees a clear line of distinction between how we think and how those who are hedonistic, how they think. And so hedonism, it is a philosophy or way of life which defines what is true what is good and what is bad, what is false in terms of pain and pleasure. In other words, if something produces pleasure for the hedonist, it is good and it is true. But if something produces pain, it is bad and it is thus false. In today's jargon, maybe not today's jargon, but from period of time I remember, um, we would express this through the phrase, if it feels good, do it. You know, if it feels good, do it. You know, if you can't love the one you want, love the one you're with. If it feels good, hey, do it. And so... That really expresses um, this this philosophy uh, that is called hedonism. <coughs> it's also expressed through the phrase, you know, how can something that feels this good be wrong? You know, that's hedonism. Or it feels so good, it must be right. And so that's hedonism. Now, hedonism, as I just defined it, it is an old philosophy of life. Um, it was developed by the ancient Greek philosophers who have come to be known as the Cyrenaica or Cy the Cyrenaica. Now, the Cyrenaica, it was a group of philosophers from roughly the 4th century B.C., led by a man named Aristippus of Cyrene. Now, Aristippus was educated under the thinking of some of the other ancient Greek philosophers, and one of them was Socrates. And so Aristippus, in his Socratic thinking, led him to conclude that the only intrinsic good is pleasure through enjoyable sensations especially enjoyable physical sensations. He also defined good as the absence of pain in either the physical or the emotional sense. And so based on this, you know, one had to conclude that since good is the absence of pain, you know, when there is pain, there is nothing good. Let me say that again. Since good is the absence of pain, if pain is there, there is no good there. There is no truth there. Now, you must understand that Aristippus defined good as the absence of pain, or that when he defined it as the absence of pain, he does not just mean the pain we would have if, you know, we fell down and broke an ankle. But when he talked about pain, he was talking about anything that was not enjoyable. To Aristippus, this was pain. 
An example of this would be to say, I don't enjoy going to church. The hedonist would say, that's painful. Therefore, it must be bad. It must not be true. And so he would define being bored as pain because it created no enjoyment or pleasure in the physical or emotional sense. After Aristippus died, you know, his philosophy of hedonism basically died with him until his grandson, a man named Aristippus the Younger, he revived it. And he even established a university in which all the curriculum was based on his grandfather's philosophy of hedonism or the belief that pleasure is good. Pleasure is true. And therefore, pleasure is to be sought after by doing things that are either physically or emotionally enjoyable. But on the other hand, all things which are painful are bad and they are thus to be avoided. Remember, he's not just talking about physical pain, but anything you just don't enjoy. I don't like it. That is to be avoided because he would say that is pain. And so this form of hedonism, it came to be known as a crass hedonism or a crude hedonism. Today, we would call it hardcore hedonism. Or it is one who does whatever is needed to sense pleasure and avoid pain. Now, the first groups to actively incorporate this, this hedonism into a philosophy of life, uh, it was the various pagan uh, religious religions in ancient Greece. And one of the most prominent false gods worshipped through hedonism was the Greek god Dionysus or Dionysus. You also know it by the Latin term Bacchus. Now Dionysus or Bacchus was the god of the vine or the god of wine. And so Dionysus was the Greek god who was supposed to be able to help break the chains of living in a normal conscious state and move one into a mystical, esoteric consciousness. And this mystical state of consciousness was a state in which one supposedly broke into the realm of the thinking of the gods, while the esoteric realm was a place where things, they really could not be understood by being in a normal conscious state. You really couldn't understand these things by using your rational, reasonable, 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 logical mind. And so one could only reach this state if if you, 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 you really got drunk and these false gods would bring you into this state. Um, and so in short, Dionysus was the God who enabled mortals to break into the realm of the gods and experience pleasure, hedonism. Nobody else could by mere, mere moral thinking or logic or reason. And so this state of consciousness, uh, it could only be obtained by producing the optimum state of pleasure. So those who follow Dionysus said, you know, this, this state of consciousness where, you know, this mystical state, this esoteric state, you could only get into this state by experiencing the most amount of pleasure you could experience. Um, because pleasure, physical pleasure, emotional pleasure, that was good according to the hedonist. That was what was really true. Remember, if it feels good, it's true. If it's enjoyable, it's true. It's good. And so... These ancient Greeks had three ways to break into this mystical era, era, uh, uh, esoteric state of consciousness and produce this optimum state of pleasure that would bring you into this mystical relationship with the gods. Number one, they would go into a pagan temple and get drunk to the point that they would fall into a euphoric stupor. 
and lose control of your mind, your mind in order that one could commune with the god Dionysus. And they believe when one finally broke into this state, it was the state of ecstasy, the most pleasurable feeling one could ever have. Remember, hedonism is pleasure to the avoidance of pain. So they would get drunk, and I guess you would feel real good. You know, I, 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 I'm not a drinker. Um, I've never been drunk, so, you know, I don't know. You know, I guess some of you could tell me. I don't know. I've never been drunk. I don't know, you know, what it what it, what it it feels like. But, um, you know, they said when you got drunk, it's the most pleasurable experience. And so now you are communing with the gods. Or number two, they would go into a pagan temple and and they would have a mantra or a chant or a sound they would articulate with their mouths or they would say say certain words over and over and over and over and over until until one went into a frenzy euphoric stupor or they would sing a song over and over and over and over and over and over and over until they went into this frenzy, euphoric stupor. And so when one broke into this state, it was called ecstasy, the most pleasurable feeling one could have. Or number three, they would go into a pagan temple and have sex with a temple prostitute. And it's amazing. They called them temple virgins. They were anything but virgins. And so you could go into one of these pagan temples and have sex with a temple prostitute, male or female. And you experience orgasm to such an extent that one entered into this state of ecstasy. And this was supposed to be the most pleasurable feeling one could have. And because it was pleasurable, it was good because supposedly there was no pain in this. It was good. And so that's hedonism. If it's pleasurable, it's good. And it's true. Now, uh, but a problem arose when people practiced this crass or crude or hardcore hedonism. And the problem was people began to realize that there were some negative consequences of living according to this hardcore, crass, crude, hedonistic life. And so people soon found out, you know, if you got drunk on wine all the time, uh, in a matter of time, all the pleasure would be gone. You know, when you're, when you're getting drunk and you're throwing up on yourself and you're in the gutter and you lose your family and everything else, they began to find out, you know, if you do this often enough, it becomes painful. And so, therefore, in, in, in a sense, this hardcore hedonism, was it was now producing the very thing it sought to avoid. Remember, the purpose of hedonism is to experience optimum pleasure and avoid pain. But they found out when you went down to the Temple of Dionysus too much and you indulged, that sooner or later this was producing what you were trying to avoid because... Sooner or later, your life will become very painful. And remember to the hedonist, that's bad. Or people soon found out, you know, if you go down to the pagan temple and you're having sex with everybody, that by God, by goodness, you, you can get a sexually transmitted disease like this. And uh, even those in ancient times, they, 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 syphilis was there and other sexually transmitted diseases were there and they understood where they where they came from. Um, you know, these uh, forensic anthropologists, they have found graves and the bones and teeth of people who died at this particular time. And through their examinations, they they understood that uh, they suffered from various sexually transmitted diseases. And so. People began to find out if I'm a hardcore hedonist and I'm going down to the temple all the time uh, having sex with whoever is available, man or woman, that, you know, by goodness, this is now becoming painful. So 
it was a problem. Or they find out, you know, when you're having sex with a lot of folks, you know, somebody may get pregnant. And that can be painful also, especially in the wallet. Or they begin to find out, you know, that families could be destroyed by having going down to the temple and having sex with all of these people. By goodness, it has destroyed my family. And so um, they, they, they begin to find out that, you know, hey, this just doing everything to seek out pleasure. It can be painful. It can be bad. Or some began to find out, you know, after a while, all sexual escapades, they become boring. And so you have to keep upping the ante until you're in some real freaky, freaky, freaky stuff. But sooner or later, even that got boring. And remember to the hedonists, if it's boring, it's painful because there is an absence of pleasure. And so they began to find out that hedonism was producing the very thing it sought to avoid. And that was pain in life. And so to make a, a long story short, the people began to discover that there was a painful price tag for living in a crass, crude, hardcore hedonistic way. Because hedonism, hedonism ended up producing the pain it was trying to avoid. And so it was because people soon began to find this out that hedonism involved into another stage in which man sought to refine his hedonism. And the group that sought to do this were called the Epicureans. And you probably heard that term. It was a particular uh, philosophical set, the Epicureans, founded by the Greek philosopher Epicurus. And the Epicureans clearly understood that if you go deep into hedonism sooner or later, it's, it's going to start being painful. They understood that and therefore they sought to refine it. And they refined it by teaching hedonism was only good if it was practiced with control. So, you know, you have to control your hedonism. And so as a result, they became more sophisticated in their hedonism or they became connoisseurs in the pursuit of pleasure. And they therefore developed a discriminating taste in the hedonistic pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. In other words, they taught, you know, you, you just control your drinking. Only drink to the extent that you get a buzz. But you don't turn into a drunkard. Uh, or when you go to the temple of Dionysus and drink oneself into a, um, an inebric stupor, um, only do it twice a month instead of every week. So, you know, going to the temple to get yourself drunk and experience the optimum amount of pleasure and then uh, get into this euphoric, ecstatic, pleasurable state. See, and you, you can't do it too much now because you'll be a drunk lying in the gutter. So instead of going there every weekend, just go maybe one or two weekends out the month. Or, you know, if you were going to the various temples and having sex with whoever was available, um, only do it with one particular temple prostitute. Just find one there that you like and only engage with him or her control your pursuit of pleasure because you don't want to end up a drunk in the gutter or you don't want to end up destroying your family um, through adultery and all kinds of sexual uh, immorality. And so in other words, they taught learn how to practice the vices that make one feel good or sense what is enjoyable just enough to put some spice in life. In other words, you can't take hedonism too far, just enough to take the edge off of life. In other words, limit one's pursuit of pleasure as a Park Avenue hedonist, a Hollywood hedonist, a Manhattan sophisticate hedonist. And so they really, you know, they tried to refine hedonism. You know, you, you want to pursue your pleasures 
You know, like that gentleman we used to see on the Dos Equis commercial, pursue your pleasures as the most interesting man in the world. Don't take it too far, just enough to take the edge off of life. So the Epicureans sought a balanced hedonism or a balanced pursuit of pleasure just to keep life enjoyable and free from the mundane or ordinary things of life. Or to achieve what the Epicureans call the ataraxic state. And so, you know, the word atarex, it is really the prescription name for tranquilizers. Therefore, the, the Epicureans sought to pursue pleasure enough, but don't go overboard and become a drunk. You know, be discriminated in your, your various sexual partners so you don't get an STD or destroy your family. But, you know, do these things just enough to produce this state they call ataraxic. Do it just enough to produce a peaceful, tranquil life or to keep the edge off. Now, I hope you see where I'm going. That's why I say hedonism, hedonism exists today. Living for the weekend. Partying it down Friday night. But see, I don't do it every I don't do it every day now. Only on Friday and Saturday night do I drink myself into a stupor and wake up the next morning with somebody who I, I don't even know their name, neither first, middle, nor last name. And so to this present time, this is the form of hedonism the majority practice as just a normal way of life. Hey, it's what you got to do. That is control or handle the vices you have, which give you pleasure. Just enough to put some spice in life. Spice in life. Avoid boredom. Enjoy oneself. Have a tranquil, peaceful life. But don't go too far and become a drunk or a drug addict. Or lose your family, your job, your friends, etc. by indulging in all of these things to such an extent that you lose everything. Now, in the contemporary world in which we live, most people don't just come out and say they are a hedonist. Maybe the late founder of Playboy magazine or the Playboy empire, Hugh Hefner, I think he did. Um, you know, some of the rappers probably would say I'm a hedonist. Um, there are probably some rock and roll stars would say it. Or, you know, some of these Hollywood actors or whatever uh, would say this. Uh, probably for pu publicity, but some of them, I guess they really... They live it out, and that's why they're all in rehab clinics and under psychiatric care. So nobody really just comes out and says, listen, I'm a hedonist. However, all of us wrestle with hedonism because none of us wants to experience pain. But we do want to experience pleasure and enjoy life. We want to experience the pleasure of a good meal. You know, we want to enjoy the holidays with family and friends. I hope you want to enjoy worship. You know, I hope you want to enjoy the word of God. And enjoy the pleasure we get out of our various hobbies. And so these things in themselves are not evil. They are not paganism. They are not hedonistic. The problem arises when we make the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain a way of life. And thus our measuring stick to determine what is good, what is evil, and what is truth is. Am I having a good time? Is it enjoyable? An avoidance of anything that is painful. Now I want to make sure you understand what I'm talking about. These are most often sinful things because, you know, I enjoy the word of God. I'm not talking about that. You know, I enjoy 
uh, biblical worship. Um, you know, I have some hobbies and I really, really, you know, I enjoy them. You know, I don't teach and preach and do theology and philosophy and history 24 seven. You know, I enjoy my family, um, my wife and my daughter immensely. I love, I love to spend time with them. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a fisherman, I'm a hunter, I'm an outdoorsman. And so, you know, I, I, I'm not talking about those things, but the pursuit of godless pressure, when that becomes your way of life, that's an issue because now you are practicing hedonism. Now, this cannot be the philosophy by which Christians live their life for several reasons, and they are as follows. Pain is at times necessary for God to bring about good in our lives. Pain is at times necessary for God to bring about the good in our lives. Some I might say, well, you know, Dr. Kendall, I don't know if I believe that. Well, let's 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 think about this. There is the death of Jesus on the cross. The scripture is very clear that Jesus died by crucifixion. For the scripture reads like this. Then they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And then the last four words say, and they crucified him. Crucifixion was the most painful, agonizing death one could ever suffer. Yet the cross Jesus died upon was absolutely necessary for our redemption. In order for Jesus to pay for our sins, in order for him to be a penal substitution for our sins, in order for him to suffer in your place on the cross what you deserve in hell, he had to go through some serious pain on the cross to satisfy the Father. Make no mistake about it. Jesus was truly God, but he was truly human. Everything he experienced on the cross, he experienced it in his humanity. Crucifixion was not the way to go. It was really, really bad and brutal. If I had time to read you some of the descriptions from some of the ancient historians on what a crucifixion scene looked like, it was a bloody mess. It was painful for Jesus. But yet it brought about good for us because in that death on the cross is our redemption. All of our sins washed away. All of our sins cast in the sea of forgetfulness by God. And we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And one of these days, uh, you know, when you die, you know, and you know Jesus, you immediately are consciously in the presence of the Lord. But that's not it, because one of these days, the Lord will reunite that soul that has been at rest in his presence where my mother and my father are. And he's going to reunite those souls into the bodies they had while on earth, but they will be glorified. Body just like Jesus had. And we will live with God in the new heaven and in the new earth where the Bible says God will make his dwelling among men. In other words, redeem men, those who know Jesus. But it took a lot of pain for Jesus to go through in order to bring us to this point and for us to have that eternity. And so we are saved through Jesus' agony, his blood, his pain. Ephesians 2.13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who are formerly afar off, were brought near by the blood of Christ. That blood he shed, it was painful. It was brutal. The blood of Jesus, which brings us near to God, was shed, which was shed by Jesus on the cross. 
You know, that cross where he shed his blood, it produced much agony and pain for Jesus, completely opposite of hedonism. Because remember, they said if it's painful, it's not good. But if Jesus had not suffered the agony and pain of the cross, nobody would be saved. I know some of you out there. You think the reason why you're going to heaven because you you're living holy. Or you're doing this or you're doing that. Not by a long shot. We are redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ alone. The basis of our justification before God is the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, the reason why you might strive to live holy is because you have been redeemed through the cross. But it's not your striving that saves you. It was and is the substitutionary death of Christ on the cross. It was a painful, agonizing, brutal death. But it totally satisfied God the Father in our behalf. To such an extent that the book of Hebrews says we are being we are saved to the uttermost. We are saved forever. We are served, saved completely. The Greek word is pantales. We are saved forever. But it took pain. Completely opposite of hedonism. And then number two, sometimes God uses painful experiences to bring about his good will for our lives. This is what happened to Joseph. Remember, um, he was sold into slavery by his brothers. And this is what Joseph said about it in Genesis 50, 19 through 20. When his brothers, after the father died, his brothers thought Joseph is now going to get revenge on us since dad Israel, Jacob has died because we sold him into slavery. Listen to what Joseph says. As for me, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good. In order to bring about this present result. To preserve many people alive. God permitted Joseph to go through some painful things in life. But God meant that for the good of his people. And because Joseph went through all that he went through, the people of Israel were saved from a great famine. And so sometimes God permits bad stuff to bring about his good will in our lives. Now, I know ain't nobody teaching that today, and that's because they're not teaching the Bible. They're teaching some other nonsense. But that's just the truth. My beloved Christian brothers and sisters in Jesus. And then number three, hedonism can't be right. The pursuit of pleasure. That's all. That's what's good. Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. It can't be true. Because it is inevitable that those who know Christ as Savior, they will suffer trials and tribulations. Simply because. That is part of the equation of belonging to Jesus Christ. John 16, 33. This is what Jesus says. These things I've spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. But be of good cheer, of good courage. I have overcome the world. And then there is this. You know, hedonism, you know, pleasure, good, pain, bad. Makes you feel good physically or, or mentally or whatever. Good. Pain. Bad. Well, the problem with that is the entire book of Ecclesiastes is devoted to explaining how physical pleasure never brings about satisfaction in life. But the pursuit of physical pleasure it always brings about utter futility in life. It brings about hopelessness in life. You know, uh, Ecclesiastes 2.1, and we believe it was written by Solomon. Or at the minimum, it's, 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 it refers to the life of Solomon. Um, you know, Solomon was the king of the playboys for all time. 
I mean, this dude had him some women. I mean, he had hundreds of wives and hundreds of concubines. A concubine was a lot of women on the side of all different shades, colors, shapes, whatever. He had it all. He had money. And I think the economists have tried to categorize how wealthy Solomon was in today's terms, but I think they can't come up with a figure. I mean, his house alone was worth billions and billions of dollars as far as today's money. He had gold, silver, silver was laying around Israel like rocks. Gold, he had entire cities just for his horses. If I'm not mistaken, archaeologists found one of Solomon's cities for just his horses. And from what I understand, it was about the size of, there's a city close to Canton called Maslin. That was just for his horses. He had it all. And this is what Solomon concluded. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure. So enjoy yourself. And behold, it too was futility. Solomon indulged in every possible pleasure and his repeated conclusion was words such as these. So I hated life. For the work which had been done under the sun was grievous to me because everything is futility and striving after the wind. But I like what Solomon concluded at the end of Ecclesiastes. After trying all this other stuff, you know what he said? Let us come to the conclusion of the whole matter. This is the entire duty of man. Fear God and keep his commandments. That's the only thing that brings contentment in life. I didn't say the absence of pain, but I said contentment in life is to know God through Jesus Christ and then live for him. It brings about contentment and satisfaction. Not the absence of pain, but contentment and joy and peace. And then from a practical standpoint, uh, it is utter folly to conclude all pain is bad and evil for quite often pain is the way the human body lets you know something is going on that needs to be addressed. You know, if your tooth is aching and they do hurt, that's your body trying to tell you. You got a diseased tooth and you better go someplace and get it taken care of. Because if you let that tooth become infected and abscess sets up in it, and you know that abscess can spread to your sinuses, to your brain, or your whole body can become developed sepsis, blood poisoning, and you can die. So pain is what God has designed the body to experience to let us know something is wrong and we need to get it addressed. So from a practical standpoint, pain cannot be bad all the time. But yet it is also true. Well, let me say this. Then it's just true that sometimes life stinks. Sometimes life just stinks. That's true for all of us. You want to know why? This is not heaven. This is not paradise. This is not the place where the local presence of God is. We cannot behold the glory of God right now. This is not heaven. This is no one's final destination. Well, no matter whether you're going to spend your eternity with God or you're going to spend your eternity in the place Jesus called hell and torment and out of darkness forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. This is no one's final resting place. This this earth is cursed with sin. Adam sin. Adam messed up. And we all inherited his sin nature. And our sin, man's sin, Adam said, 
is the reason why at times life stinks. It's just the way it is, folks. It's called life. But it is also true God does give us things to enjoy in life in this world. But that doesn't mean that they are our total pursuit. Our total pursuit and affection should be towards God. We should be seeking after God with all of our hearts, soul, strength, and might. That is our purpose. To live for God. To know Jesus more and more and more and more. To get in the word of God. And have the Holy Spirit illuminate your mind. And grow in the word of God. Grow in the things of Christ. Being transformed from glory to glory. Every day we're being Conform to the very image of Christ. That is to be our pursuit. Our obsession. But God does give us things to enjoy in life. He just does. God is good. God is gracious. God is merciful. He gives us things to enjoy. For, uh, 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 First Timothy 6, 17. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Very quickly, hedonism and the contemporary church. It is sad, but hedonism, to a certain extent, it exists in the contemporary church. Why? Because the only reason why we go into church is to have a good time. And that's it. If everybody ain't, ain't jumping, hopping, or whatever you do, falling out or whatever, we say, ah, service was lousy today. See, if that's why you're going to church, you're going for the church or the wrong reason anyways. Church is not for you. Worship is not for you. Worship is for God. The question is, did God get anything out of your worship? The question is, did God feel good about what you gave him in the worship service? Was it in spirit and in truth, but we are finding ourselves going to church just to have a good time and to feel good when we leave church. That's hedonism. You should have joy in the Lord when you leave joy, but joy and seeking pleasure. Not the same thing, my beloved. Not the same thing. Not the same thing. Um... Then we got word of faith theology. Name it, claim it, bag it, and drag it. That's hedonism. Because that false doctrine teaches God only wants you to experience blessings and riches. Name it, claim it. God only wants you to experience good things in life. And it's such a reprehensible teaching. They actually teach. If you're experiencing pain in life or you're sick or going through, you know, you, you must be in some sin or you must not be positively confessing stuff. That's hedonism. Wearing the garment of the false garment of Christianity is hedonism. It's seeking optimum pleasure, but seeks to avoid pain. False doctrine. Um, you know, we're deliberately designing church today to make the people feel good rather than designing the church to enable people to grow in Christ, to grow in the mind of God, to grow in the mind of Christ, to grow and to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world that we need to be. You know, church is supposed to uh, uh, enable people. To stand before God and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant, faithful over a few things. Make you ruler over many. Now, I don't know what your eschatology is, but you know what I'm talking about. Church is supposed to be to prepare you to meet God, Christian, because you're going to give an account. But we're designing church for the people so they can feel good. You know, feel good about church again. What is that? That's hedonism. Hedonism has seeped into the church and it's not of God you know David said this better than anybody when it comes to worship um, 
2 Samuel 24, 24. However, the king said to Aruna, no, that's David, but I will surely buy it for a price for I will not offer burnt orphans, offerings to the Lord my God, which cost me nothing. David refused to worship the Lord unless it cost him something. I'm not offering up to the Lord a free sacrifice I paid nothing for. I will surely buy it for a price. And we want to worship God today in luxury and and ease. I'm just trying to make it so comfortable for the folks. But I want to let you know, unless your worship involves sacrifice, it is worthless. It costs you something to worship God correctly. And then hedonism exists in the church because... You know, we have people determine, determining what is true by how it makes them feel. You know, there are some people, they judge whether a preacher is really preaching about how it makes them feel. I didn't, I didn't get none of that sermon. He, he, didn't, he didn't rock my boat. He didn't give me the heebie-jeebies. See, you want, you want the preacher to make you feel good. That is a very subtle form of, of, of hedonism. The preacher's job is to preach the word to you. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort. With all long suffering and doctrine or teaching. Church is supposed to make you grow in Christ. Not feel good. Now, if you end up feeling good because you're growing in Christ, praise God. That's a legitimate good feeling. But we're designing church, you know, to, to make people feel good. And good preaching and truth is determined by how you feel. False doctrine, hedonism. All right. And so that's hedonism. And I have to search myself, make sure I don't fall into that. And all of us do. And so think about these things and I'll be back and I'm going to talk about scientism and then I have a lot of other things to talk about. As I've said, I've been doing this for years and years and years and years and years. I, I've kept every sermon I've ever preached. I've been preaching 33 years. I've kept everything I've done. I even have it on paper and, and on computer. And so I have a lot of stuff that I can that I have to say until either I, I, I God takes me or, 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 or whenever. And so we'll be back. Pray for us. Um, Hope you enjoy these. Um, God bless you, my beloved. Hope you all have a wonderful day. Till the next time, good day.